All right, uh, let's then start. So good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming. So it's great to see everybody. So we would like to keep the conference as interactive as possible. So to ask questions, you can use chat and raise hand features, or you can simply unmute yourself. Also, it would be really great to have your video on if possible. And please use your full real name. And now, as our first speaker, we're very happy to welcome Gavin Salam from Oxford, who will tell us about Amplitudes and Beyond at the LHE. Gavin. Thank you, Anastasia, and thank you for the invitation. Um, so as some of you know, this talk was, um, was put together at the last minute. Um, and I also have not got much experience with Zoom talks. This is my first full Zoom talk. So we'll see what it gives. Uh, now, I haven't been to the Zoom to the Amplitudes Conference, um, to any of its editions over the years, and I wanted to find out a little bit more about uh, what the audience is likely to be. So I started off in two thousand and nine, uh, and looked up each of the speakers of the conference on Inspire and took the three most recent papers from then uh, and just passed them to see if they had the word LHC. There were about uh, 70 speakers altogether. 20 speakers had LHC typically in their, uh, in their papers. Or, well, 20 of the papers had LHC and the rest didn't. So we can zoom forward to 2020 and see how this evolves. And what's changed is that there's still about 20 papers that have the word LHC in them. Um, but the fraction of other papers uh, from the conference speakers has gone up. So keeping this in mind, I decided to try and make the talk fairly general. Um, and I'm going to start with an overview of experimental particle physics in the 20, 2020s and 30s. Fairly brief, but just to give a picture of what kinds of questions we may see answered. So as you imagine from the, the talk title, one of the big things I'll talk about is the LHC. And we'll come back later to why the LHC has such a central role. Uh, this slide shows the plans for the LHC over the coming 20 years, roughly. Uh, and what it shows is a function of the year. In blue here, this line here, the integrated luminosity, roughly speaking, proportional to the number of collisions delivered. Today, we're at 140 inverse femtoburns, burns. And as we move forwards, uh, by 2025, that number will go up by a factor of three, by 2030, by a factor of eight, and by 2037, by a factor of 20 or even higher, perhaps, depending on what the machine manages to deliver. So 95% of collisions from the LHC are still still to be delivered. A huge investment is going on to actually improve the LHC. Um, this is a slide uh, from uh, people, some of the people building the, high, the upgrades, the high luminosity upgrades, uh, outlining uh, what is going on. Uh, and there's new magnets, there's state-of-the-art uh, high field magnets, uh, there's better collimation, Many things are going on to make this possible. And not just at the level of the accelerator, but also at the level of the detectors. Uh, because the conditions in order to con collect so many collisions are gonna be much tougher, um, much higher event rates, in particular, much more pileup. You see all these tracks here uh, at Atlas. Uh, and for example, at LHCB, they're gonna be pioneering uh, new concepts like real-time analysis, where basically within the trigger, you analyze the event and deduce things about the event uh, in real time. So you never even write out the full events. And that's to cope with the huge data flow. Now the LHC isn't alone. Um, for example, Bell 2 will come on, will play a major role in uh, flavor physics and complement LHCB in many respects. Uh, and at the same time as delivering the physics, it will also be demonstrating key concepts that matter, for example, for potential future projects like FCCEE. 
And this shows uh, um, the beta star values that are being achieved and, that's, and what is needed uh, in different colliders. Um, now, there are also experiments to do with neutrinos, uh, June and Hyper-K. June in the, was very well known in the US, Hyper-K is in Japan. Uh, these have timelines on the next seven to 10 years, perhaps. Uh, muon G minus two, of course, and direct dark matter detection experiments, uh, where there are huge upgrades still to come. Now, these are the big experiments. And in addition, there are many small experiments. I've listed a handful here, but there are many more than just the ones I've listed. These are some of the ones I'm most familiar with for various reasons, um, but there are many others. So one of the things I'll try to get across in this talk is also how the LHC fits into that, um, that vast swathe of things. Why is the LHC special in that respect when there are so many other experiments going on? Well, first of all, let's look at the kinds of physics that the LHC does. Uh, here are the core uh, physics topics at the LHC. Uh, and there's a color code uh, to give you an idea of the uh, directly probed energy scales. So for example, uh, standard model physics, the experiments measure things from about 100 MeV up to 40 MeV. So that's a, a factor of sort of ra dynamic range of about uh, 40,000. Um, and the LHC is probably quite unique in, in being able to probe such a wide range of momenta in one experiment. Uh, not everything goes down so low. Top quark physics, for example, and Higgs physics are about at, at, are mostly at the electroweak scale, with top quark physics extending higher. Direct new particle searches go higher. Uh, and some of the physics is really mostly at the low end. So for example, flavor physics, uh, bottom mostly in some charm and heavy ion physics. Now, in this talk, I'm going to concentrate on four of these areas. Uh, standard model, top quark, Higgs physics, and direct new particle searches, because they share many features that are relevant to the amplitudes conference. And you, there are many possible views of the physics goals of the LHC. Um, but this is the view of what I, this is my view of what I consider to be uh, the essential ones. So there's establishing the structure of the Higgs sector of the standard model. And I'll come back to that uh, later uh, in some detail. There's searching for signs of physics beyond the standard model, both direct searches, for example, dark matter candidates, supersymmetry and so forth, and indirect searches. Uh, and then there's measuring standard model parameters, for example, the top mass, um, measuring proton structure, establishing methods for precise theory data comparisons, which enable the other two goals to actually happen. I'm gonna start with direct new particle searches. Why? Because that's one of the things that was very much in the news uh, when LHC turned on. We all expected we were all told to expect new discoveries of supersymmetry or anything else uh, in the years immediately after turn on, and it didn't happen. Um, but the motivation for those arguments, the electroweak hierarchy problem, the WIMP miracle, still to some extent hold today. Uh, and the LHC is the essence of energy frontier exploration. So what is left? Uh, the LHC has been operating at close to maximal energy for some time. Uh, how much scope is there for continuing these discoveries? This plot here um, tries to illustrate that in a very rough fashion, uh, but it's enough to give a, an idea. And what it shows is as a function of the system mass that has been probed so far, for example, Z primes have been excluded up to about five TeV, uh, it shows how much more you can exclude or discover um, by the end of the LHC in 2038. Uh, so in this case, you can gain about one and a half TV increase in mass reach over the next 18 years. Uh, that's not a huge factor. One really wants to think about this on a logarithmic scale. On the other hand, at the lower end, for example, 
for things that are being probed at one TeV at the moment, uh, you can reach two TeV. That's a factor of two. And it's more, so it's more significant at the lower end of the scale. Maybe it's useful to put that in a, a longer term context. Uh, so this here shows the, uh, the Z prime, the sequential standard model Z prime limit as a function of time since the 1980s. So going back to the SPPS through Tevatron and the Tevatron upgrade and then the LHC turn on here and potential future colliders. Uh, including the LHC upgrade. And it's useful to help guide the eye maybe to put a line on that, which shows that rough, the average increase in reach is roughly a factor of two per decade. That's what we've been achieving over the past, uh, the past two decades. Uh, and if a 100 TeV collider were to be built in the, 1940s, in the 2040s, um, well, would be, to be built in the 1940s, we'd all be delighted, of course. Um, if we were to be built in the 2040s, um, then uh, we'd still be on track with that. So the potential factor of two at the LHC is to put, to put over the next 20 years roughly, is to be put in that context. It's slower than average, but experiments often have an initial fast stage of exploration of the energy frontier, and then they carry on making slower progress. Not everything is that slow. For example, some searches, uh, this is a projection for Electric SUSY partners, have a huge increase. So this is where we stand in 2020, uh, with a limit of barely, sort of a very small part of the phase space, for this is uh, long lived decays, uh, expanding by a factor of three or four by 2038. So in some cases, there are huge gains to be had. And another example is LHCB at very small masses below the GEV. Um, where there are again, very large gains to be had, roughly a factor of 20 increase in mass reach. Now, I said that the LHC is special uh, compared to other experiments. And this, this page is intended to illustrate why. Um, the LHC searches are extremely broadband. This here is a general search. Uh, it's one of the very few of its kind where the experiments are just looking for, Atlas in particular is looking for any anomaly with respect to standard model predictions. Uh, and they've divided the events into 704 different classes and they have about 10 to the five bins. So this gives you an idea of the scope of what the LHC, the scope and breadth of what the LHC uh, is trying to do. And this search is especially reliant on theory predictions and a particular amplitudes, precisely because it's so general. Other searches are targeting very specific signatures uh, and they use a considerable mix of data-driven uh, and theory uh, background estimates. This one relies very much on theory. So what, goes, what kind of theory does it rely on? This table here uh, gives the list, somewhat truncated, of all the backgrounds that they've studied uh, in their search. And Went too far, that's what I wanted. Um, there are many columns here. So what I want to do in the next few minutes is talk through some of these columns to try and give a context of where amplitudes are being used and in what form. So what I want to show you is a, an animation of an event. This is actually an E plus E minus event because it's simpler to represent. Uh, and I'll show a projection on two axes and at the same time show the time. And the time here is negative, it's before the collision has happened. And this is a beams coming in, producing a QQ bar state. And then one zooms out because this is gonna cover many orders of magnitude. And in these early stages, you have three, four particles. And as the uh, event evolution continues over time, you get this showering, this branching into many particles. And overall, the event evolution spans seven orders of magnitude in space and in time. So 
So we're just about getting to the point where you have final hadrons. Uh, the blue particles were quarks and gluons, and these red ones are hadrons. So this is the actual state that gets measured in an experiment. Now, we can view that in terms of energy scales, where you have a hard process. That was what happens at the very short times. And it's here that the amplitudes, as they're being used at the moment, are most critical. Um, you have what's called a part on shower, which brings you down to a scale that's of the order of a couple of GeV, where you have this multiplication of partons, uh, and then the hadronization step. And it's these hadrons that can be directly compared to the pattern in the experiment. So now if we go back to this table, uh, where I've shortened it so that we can add some annotation, we can first look at where the amplitudes are coming. And you see that there's two entries for amplitudes. Uh, one is called cross-section normalization, and the other is referred to as matrix element accuracy. The matrix element accuracy is essentially the differential distributions. The amplitude is being used for all the differential distributions in the momentum of jets and, uh, and leptons, for example. Uh, and here, these are getting rescaled. Uh, the overall cross-section gets rescaled to match a normalization that might be next, next to the leading order in some cases, might be only next to leading order in others. In some cases, the normalization is matched to fit data. So the immediate question you might ask is, why, are this, why is there so much here at leading order? Uh, there's a few entries here which are at next to leading order. Even though, for example, one jet here is known at next to next to leading order, that's not included. Uh, many processes here that are known to higher order uh, are only leading order. What's going on? Well, partly there's a, uh, there's a time delay. First of all, this article is about two years old. Um, this is the most recent general search paper there is. Uh, secondly, when a paper of this kind is being written, there's a long, it takes a while to write. So you set, uh, set your generators probably at the beginning of working on the paper. Uh, and that might take two years. So in, in essence, this is using technology that is probably three or four years old relative to what's known today. That's not the only aspect though. Another aspect is that you have to interface these matrix elements, these amplitudes to the part on showers, uh, which are what take you from the hard scale, hundreds of GV, down to the, the one GV scale. Uh, and this column here gives you the prescription or the tool which comes with the prescription for matching between the amplitudes in the part on shower. So for giving the link. Yeah. Uh, and the ability to incorporate amplitudes in a good prescription that matches with the part on shower is also one of the limiting factors. So for example, the best that can be done at next to next to leading order today is a, a zero jet process at next to next to leading order. No one jet process, no one knows how to match a one jet process uh, with a part and shower generator at next to next to leading order. This still isn't the end of the story because you have non-perturbative physics. The proton structure comes in through the PDF set, the pattern distribution function, and then you need a set of parameters and a model that match with the, uh, the that gives you hadrons at the end. And all of this is what gets compared to data in this example of this general search. So you might well ask, well, what happened? So what do we need? Well, we can, maybe it's useful to talk about the stages of an amplitude. Um, there's a stage where it's too hard to calculate. You just don't know it, it's on the wish list. Uh, and then you get to a stage where it's known in principle analytically, but no explicit numbers. Getting from this red box to this first box here is a, often a major breakthrough, uh, which enables you then to at least know one or two phase space points. Maybe not physical, but it's a proof that you can actually evaluate something. Uh, sometimes people take a numerical route. Uh, often they take an analytical route. To be able to start using it for phenomenology, you often need hundreds of phase space points. And then you can start using interpolation. And classic examples where that's been done are dye Higgs production uh, with full top mass um, effects uh, and TT bar production. Uh, and once you've got that, 
then you want to improve it further and see if you can get a C++ or a Fortran function that you can just call. Often the first stages of these are slow and unstable. And as people get more understanding of what's going on, eventually it becomes possible to write a function that's C++ or Fortran that is public code, fast, problem-free, just runs. Each of these stages brings important value, but for broad experimental use of the LHC, you need to get to the last one. It's not the only thing you need, um, but that's what you need to get. And that's part of the reason why the experiments at the moment don't necessarily use the very latest amplitudes that are available because maybe they're at an earlier stage of this evolution. It's not the only aspect that's relevant. Um, amplitudes need to be sub supplemented with the subtraction slicing schemes. And there's a sense in which one could do a similar set of boxes for these subtraction and slicing schemes. Uh, it takes a long time to these are to these get to the stage where it's easy to get an answer with high statistics, uh, stable answers. You need pattern distribution functions to the same order, which implies you need splitting functions to the same order, uh, and you need merging and matching with pattern showers in order to get hadron level predictions. And here too, the technology is very tricky. So you need advances on all of these aspects um, before you get into generic use in the LHC experiments. So you might say, well, what happened to factorization? Um, why do you need all of this? Uh, if you've got infrared and colonia safe observables, you can ignore most of the physics between the hard scale or Q and lambda QCD, the non-perturbative scale with a standard factorization formula. You've got your perturbative expansion, you've got amplitudes and subtraction and slicing, you've got your part and distribution, your part and distribution functions, and you can ignore all the Hadronach stuff because it's suppressed as a power of lambda QCD divided by this hard scale. And this is true if you've got the right observable. One of the difficulties is that detector effects uh, are not infrared and polynomial safe. Um, and there are situations where the detector is actually almost giving you something that's collinear and infrared safe at the end. Um, but off, there are also regions where detectors can have an order one impact. And to understand the, that order one impact, you need the full hadron level description of collider events. You need something that's not infrared and collinear safe. And when you need that, you lose the ability to have this simple picture. You still make use of the factorization picture to some extent, but you need to have an explicit model for what happens for this piece on the right, for the non-perturbative piece, for example. You need an explicit model, not just for the first two, three, or four orders here. Uh, you need something that goes to all orders because you can have 30, 40, 50 gluons uh, in the final state before they convert into hadrons. So are there any places where one can use this? Well, the place where this gets used most often uh, is in standard model physics. And I'll give some examples from the QCD and electroweak sector, but there are also examples in the Higgs and top sector, many examples. And this is the sector where we measure the standard model parameters. For example, the top quark mass, where we learn about basic non-perturbative inputs like part and distribution functions and test many of our methods. Uh, and it's also one place where you can look for, validate the standard model and look for deviations. Now, if there's a message that I want to give from this sector of LHC work, it's that it's possible to get to very low uncertainties. So this shows the Z boson transition momentum uh, and the black dots here are the experimental data here uh, in the differential distribution here normalized uh, with data as a normalization. So the data are just one here. And if you look closely and really zoom in, you find that the uncertainties in the data are systematically below 1% over a broad range here. This is something that could not have been imagined about the LHC a long time ago. Uh, theory has a 2% uncertainty. So it's just about approaching this, thanks to past, the past year's advances in fixed order predictions and resummation. And you have a brilliant uh, agreement. So this is demonstration, the demonstration that the LHC data and theory can both successfully achieve high precision, this agreement between them. It's a very powerful uh, demonstration. And it's what we need to keep in mind thinking about what else can be done at the LHC. Uh, 
and progress in other processes. For example, this year, the first two to three NN NNLO calculation, the PP to three gammas, uh, also shows nice agreement, though the uncertainties here are much larger. Um, and with Drell-Yan at N cubed LO, uh, this is also going to be uh, an interesting uh, time to actually see what, uh, for example, what the effect is on PDFs because of this small shift between next to next to leading order and N cubed LO. Standard model physics to some extent is, especially the Z sector, uh, is relatively well established. Higgs physics is a very different game. Now you may have heard people say the standard model is complete now that the Higgs has been discovered. But I think that's uh, the wrong way of viewing things because uh, we're as interested in interactions as we are in particles. Uh, and just to give a tongue in cheek illustration, it's all the particles without the interactions really don't look the same as the particles with the interactions. Uh, Now you might say, well, every interaction we've studied at the standard model has been the same, it's always worked. But that's partly because the sectors that have been really well tested are all similar, gauge sectors. Um, and we're seeing the same thing over and over again. And if you examine another corner of the gauge sector, it's perhaps not so surprising that it comes out working. But the Higgs sector is extremely different in structure. Uh, till seven years ago, none of these terms had been observed directly, or eight years ago. Uh, and what, we're, what the LHC is really doing in terms of being a frontier machine is exploring these structures for the first time. Uh, for example, Yukawa couplings, why do they matter? Well, they give quarks uh, their mass, a sort of fundamental mass. Uh, and in particular then, we believe, we haven't tested this, we have no direct evidence for this, that the Yukawa couplings are responsible for the proton being lighter than the neutron because the up quark is lighter than the down. And that's responsible for uh, the stability of protons. And so the hydrogen atom in chemistry and biology as we know it. So these Yukawa couplings are vitally important uh, for the world around us. Uh, and I think one of the biggest, or the biggest result in the past two years is the direct observation by Atlas and CMS of these Yukawa couplings uh, for the third generation. And this is an example here for uh, uh, the Higgs production association with top. On the left-hand side is inclusive Higgs production, and you see a small peak there. Uh, the right-hand side is in events with top quarks. And this is a very nice demonstration that given the presence of a top quark, uh, you're much more likely to produce a Higgs boson. And that's the evidence that we have that the Higgs couples to tops uh, and is responsible for the top mass. And it's consistent with the standard model to within about 20%. So what are the metrics for success here going forwards? Uh, well, in the long term, the question is, can we see the Higgs self-coupling? There are varying opinions about how important this is. I think it's fairly fundamental because the Higgs self-coupling is what holds the rest of the, of the standard model together. And we've never seen a fight of the fourth theory demonstrated actually, actually in, in real life. It's in the textbooks, but not in, not no, there's no experimental demonstration. In the medium term, uh, what we want to do is to evolve today's constraints on the Higgs sector from 10 to 20% towards accuracy. We wouldn't consider QED established if it had only been tested at 10%. And similarly, we, it's questionable whether we should consider the standard model, the Higgs, the scalar sector of the, of the standard model established with the current precision that we have on it. Um, and as bonuses, we may also maximize us and we, sh we should hope to maximize our sensitivity to new physics, both at colliders and small experiments. Um, but keeping in mind that the form it takes and whether it's even accessible is in nature's hands, not ours. So here, what I want to concentrate is this medium term. How do we get this accuracy higher? Well, to, some, to a large extent, this is the topic of, of amplitudes, uh, perhaps not directly, but indirectly, uh, many of the talks, ultimately the hope is that they will feed through uh, to enable us, to help us to do this. Uh, and to quantify how much of an improvement we need, uh, this is an example from TTH production from the CMS discovery paper, um, where, which shows mu TTH, so the ratio of the observed TTH cross-section to the expected one from theory, and showing the various sources of uncertainty. And the statistical and experimental 
are both experiment on the uh, CMS side. And if you look at the theory uncertainties, both for the background and the signal, they're very much comparable in size to the experimental ones. The statistical error has a potential to go down by a factor of six at the high luminosity LHC, with a factor of 40 in data relative to this paper. Uh, and we'll only benefit from that. We'll only be able to draw the conclusions about the fundamental Lagrangian of particle physics if theory keeps up. And both signals and backgrounds matter here. And progress in experiment is going to be not just in a single number. It's not just going to be a cross section. But as illustrated in this slide from Andre David at uh, the Zurich Phenomenology Workshop a few months ago, uh, one goes from discovery to measuring rates to measuring differential distributions uh, in a relatively short space of time. And we can expect the same to see the same for GTH production and many other Higgs processes. When you start to establish things and they agree with the standard model, then you can consider going to EFTs. And there's a lot of work on EFTs happening. Um, in particular, EFTs are parameterized also sensitivity to the kinematics. Uh, the dimension six and higher operators have kinematic structures that are not present there in the standard model uh, that grow as you go to higher momenta. Um, and so you're getting maximal use out of distributions from them. And this is one of the areas that's also going to see a lot of benefit from precise understanding of the standard model expectation. Something I like to, uh, I like to think about is what mass rate reach do we gain from indirect probes, from the potential to see deviations from some of expectations? Uh, comparing to the recorded data, which isn't always the same as the analyzed data, we expect roughly a factor of 20 increase in luminosity from today to the end of the high luminosity LHC. Uh, so that means the statistical precision can go up by the square root of that, about four and a half. Now, if you examine a dimension six operator interfering with dimension four, uh, if you probe a scale lambda for new physics, the effects go as one over lambda squared. So the increase in high scale lambda, ultraviolet scale lambda new physics to which we're sensitive is going to be roughly the square root of that 4.5. So a factor of two. So this is a better improvement than the direct searches at the high end of the LHC mass reach. And it's a comparable improvement at the low end. Um, so the fact that it's a, a better improvement at the high end of the LHC mass reach is one of the reasons I think why it's justified for so many people to be excited about uh, EFT style um, uh, studies. Now, top physics and Higgs physics talk to each other a lot. Uh, we saw the example with TTH and there's a lot of discussion going on, both EFT and non-EFT about how well, for example, we can constrain uh, this Higgs self-interaction even at the LHC without a future collider. Um, and one of the big issues is that uh, uncertainty in top Higgs interactions plays into uncertainty on di-Higgs production uh, or the interpretation of di-Higgs production. Um, so this is illustrated here where if you just consider varying the, uh, the Higgs self-interaction, this uh, dashed light blue area, you get one constraint on the, on the self-interaction. But if you allow variation, for example, of uh, the top Yukawa, you also you get a much wider, much looser constraint on the self-interaction. Um, on the other hand, TTH maybe can also be used to constrain the, uh, the Higgs self-interaction. Um, because the term that is proportional to the self-interaction has a different shape from the standard model, uh, let's say the QCD, the sort of default TTH diagram. Uh, it's in blue versus red. And maybe we can use, if we understand those shapes well enough, both experimentally and theoretically, uh, we can get direct sensitivity to that diags interaction through there. This is a very important question. We'll have to see how this moves forward um, because this really is one of the, the major unresolved aspects of the standard model in terms of uh, being established. Well, this of course is one of the big topics of the uh, sort of relates to the sort of advances in amplitudes um, because the lack of TTH amplitudes is one of the things that prevents us from going to next to next to leading order there. 
uh, this slide from Lorenzo Tancredi uh, illustrates uh, some of the, uh, the challenges that come into this process. Um, but uh, I think you probably are far more expert than me in discussing what the real challenges are here. Um, and we should keep in mind that it's not just getting TTH, but you need TTPB and many other backgrounds at a high accuracy in order to really do this physics well. So there are two more topics I'd like to briefly cover. One relates purely to top quark physics. Now, uh, a plot that's been shown many times uh, is the relates the stability of uh, the standard model universe uh, to the top mass and the Higgs mass. And the top mass is crucial here. And there's a lot, been a lot of discussion about the top mass. Uh, what scheme it's being measured in, what, uh, what scheme Monte Carlo, Pardon Showers have it in. Uh, and I think it's, it's important to remember that it's, there's more to this problem than just the scheme of the top mass. Uh, this plot from work by Ferrara Ravazio, Nazan and Aliari and Thomas Dierso um, shows the distribution of reconstructed top mass after part and showering and after hadronization. And you see that uh, the peaks have shifted a little bit of the order of half a GeV. And the overall shape of the, after, the distribution after hadronization is much broader, especially at the lower end. You're losing energy from hadronization. Um, and if you're aiming for precision on the top mass, you need to get understand all of these effects. It's not just a question of the pole mass as sort of things. And there's been some very nice work by Nazan for Ravazi Nariari, where uh, they've gained understanding about how to really calculate non perturbative effects, not just with the top quark mass scheme, but also final state effects. Uh, it's in a certain approximation in the leading NF effects using the normal ones. Um, but this already brings a lot of insight uh, into what's going on. And also offers the potential maybe uh, uh, to find ways that are free of, uh, of lambda, order lambda QCD corrections. Um, for example, looking at the decay of a massive object using just the light lepton uh, has been proposed by Kawabata et al. And, uh, and that might offer an avenue that you can test with this method. Now, these methods that, uh, of inserting gluon, uh, inserting fermion loops here uh, and using them to probe the non-perturbative uh, structure have the potential to be very powerful. There are many places where we have questions, even a simple thing like the ZPT distribution. We don't know if that has lambda over Q corrections or lambda squared over Q squared corrections. If it has lambda over Q, um, it could be that next to next to leading order is the highest accuracy that's worth having because hadronization will be larger than any higher order corrections. If it's lambda squared over Q squared, there's a huge potential for increasing the precision uh, of our predictions. Uh, so we really need answers to these questions that uh, currently we don't have. The very last topic I'd like to touch on um, also touches on amplitude, but in a somewhat indirect way. Uh, and this is that it, if you look at events, sometimes this is a QCD event. This is an event with a Higgs and a Z boson decaying hydronically. You see that broadly in terms of the pattern of energy flow, they look quite similar. Though with a little bit of energy, more energy going out to the side here, for example, in the QCD event than in this Higgs and Z event. Now by eye, you can't see much of a difference. Um, but the experimenters have been trying to pull out signals like this. For example, a high PT Z to B B decay is shown here by CMS, but they have five sigma for this. And a high PT Higgs to B B decay is shown here at one sigma. Um, and Atlas has similar results, a slightly higher significance and lower momentum. So how do you distinguish these decays? Well, this wasn't done in those particular analyses, but increasingly uh, people are exploring neural networks. Uh, this is an illustration of jet images, uh, which are very powerful tools. And to give you an idea of how powerful, um, this here is the ability to reject background. So for example, at 50% efficiency, 
for tagging a double uh, a W boson specifically, you can reject a factor of 100 in, uh, in QCD backgrounds. Um, if you basically use methods from about you know, five to 10 years ago that look just at the jet mass, cleaned up in some way, but just the jet mass. If you look at the rest of the structure inside a jet, you can get a factor of 100 more rejection of background. Um, if you bring in suitable machine learning techniques. Now, one of the th issues with that uh, is that you're relying very much on these generators uh, to correctly reproduce the full structure of, uh, of hundreds of particles in a final state. And they're using essentially an iteration of a two to three splitting kernel. They're taking a splitting kernel that take, maps two particles to three and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it to give you n particles. And there are many questions that we don't, until recently, we didn't know the answer to. For example, in what sense is the distribution of, final, uh, of n final, or final state particles correctly described? Uh, we don't just need n of 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. We need n of 10, 20, 30. Uh, in principle, we have the amplitudes for these in some cases, at leading order. Um, but the amplitudes that come out of these bottom showers don't even reproduce these leading order amplitudes. They do, however, reproduce some limits of them. Uh, and one of the things that we've been working on is understanding how to classify the phase space to understand and analyze the asymptotic limits of parton showers. And if you can do that, you can start designing parton showers that are better able to reproduce um, amplitudes for arbitrary numbers of particles. Not the full amplitudes, uh, but you can reproduce uh, the characteristics of amplitudes in particular in their singular limits. And you can ask about which singular limits can you, can you reproduce. When you learn to do that, uh, you can start to carry out quite a few tests. For example, you can compare showers to logarithmic resummations. And the showers that do, don't reproduce the amplitudes um, also fail to get uh, logarithmic resummation correctly. Whereas showers that do reproduce the amplitudes uh, are able to reproduce logarithmic resummation results across a wide range of observables. Uh, so this connection between pattern showers and amplitudes, I think is very important if we're gonna start using the, all the information that's contained in events, information which is very, appears to be very valuable, at least in some cases, and learning how to make pattern showers better, i.e. how to reproduce amplitudes better, and, and not just tree level amplitudes, but loop amplitudes as well, uh, I think is one of the tasks uh, that we need to think about in the coming years. Um, and this work shows that there's a baseline for this, that it is possible to actually ask these questions about part and showers. So to come to the end of the talk, the LHC has already far surpassed what was originally expected in terms of potential for accurate measurements. I don't think anyone expected that uh, Z production differentially would be done with sub percent accuracy, um, or that we'd have the theory ability to compare uh, with the data of that accuracy. And relative to what we have at the moment, there's a factor of between 20 and 80 times more statistics on its way. So potential between four and nine times higher accuracy relative to the, uh, the data that's actually being published and analyzed. Um, the only rigorous tool we have is perturbation theory. <laughs> and progress in calculating amplitudes is essential for exploiting this. Uh, and that's really one aspect that we can't get around. Without progress in amplitudes, uh, we won't be able to make use of this data. At the same time, it's worth keeping in mind that there are a number of other factors that come into this, whether it's part and shower, matching, matching and merging between part and showers and the amplitudes, hadronization, that all become increasingly important as, as one pushes the, uh, the boundaries of accuracy and information extraction at the LHC. Um, so, there are many fronts on which we're gonna to have to make uh, significant progress, uh, arguably uh, um, not just incremental progress, but qualitatively new ways of thinking about these problems uh, that are going to be important for solving, for getting the most out of the LHC. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Gavin, for the beautiful talk. Uh, now we have time for questions. Could people please raise their hands or unmute themselves? There was a raised hand from Emil. Sorry, it was a mistake. Okay, uh, Nima, Nima, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, that was a that was a really beautiful talk. Uh, I actually had um, uh, just a uh, comment and a uh, and a question. I think when when it comes to um, uh, quote unquote precision involving involving uh, the Higgs, especially anything involving loops touching the Higgs, um, uh, even something like uh, uh, even something basic like uh, Higgs to glue glue with the top loop or Higgs to gamma gamma with the W and top loops and so on. Um, uh, I, I just wanted to say that, that it's really crucial to make these kind of off-shell measurements of the properties of the Higgs, because that's totally crucially tied into the mysteries of the hierarchy problem. Until we really have, have an idea that, 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 that the Higgs couplings off-shell um, uh, behave like we expect them to. Um, uh, well, anyway, that, that's... Uh, 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 it, yeah, I agree. I mean, I agree fully with that. You know, of yeah, course, that, that's, that's very important. Uh, and, and actually, but just uh, along those lines, I wanted to ask uh, uh, a, uh, a question. Um, so, so people talk a lot about uh, looking at the triple Higgs coupling, and um, and of course, uh, in the, in the triple Higgs coupling, we have this uh, we have this box diagram with uh, with the uh, top quark, and then you have to look for the triple Higgs coupling. There's a sort of small correction on top of that. Um, but it, it's it's conceivable that if there's you know some exotic mechanism that, that 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 we don't understand yet that sort of shuts off the the coupling of the Higgs to top quarks when the top quarks get off shell by more than a certain amount, uh, which is at least a sort of rough idea that, that you might think of for something that would be relevant for the hierarchy problem. That uh, that that we would modify that box diagram contribution by by like order 100 um, percent, and um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering what the sort of, uh, uh, if we, if instead of talking about sort of projections for uh, how accurately we might be able to measure the triple Higgs coupling just for that entire process, um, uh, uh, if there's something even of sort of order 100% off with that, uh, with that top loop for that diagram, um, would, we, would that hit us over the head uh, or, or would we still have to uh, uh, work hard to be able to see it? You, you see the question I'm asking, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah. So I think there's there's two elements to, to answer that. One is, um, uh, so what accuracy do you expect to see? So there's two questions. There's the Higgs self-interaction and there's double Higgs production. And what gets measured is, of course, dub, uh, double Higgs uh, production. Uh, and there I think it's looking like uh, if you combine the different sources of measurement, you may, may be able to achieve 20% accuracy, so five sigma. Uh, observation of, of dihex production. So if there's something that changes the, the rate of dihex production by 100%, um, that will be just about discoverable at the five sigma level. That the change will be, the sort of discrepancy with the standard model. I think the other aspect is that there are other ways of seeing uh, off-shell top interactions with the Higgs. Um, so uh, when you go to, uh, to high Higgs momentum, uh, you've got a large momentum, larger than usual momentum transfer through the top loop. So you've got a, a box, uh, or at least in some, you know, one of the contributions is that you have a box where a Higgs is on one corner of the box and then you've got a glue on at the other corner of the box. So it's, uh, and, uh, and so if there's a strongly momentum dependent uh, effect there in the top Higgs interaction, one might see it there too. Um, People have looked at this in the context more of a, of a point-like interaction of replacing the, um, the top loop. Um, so I'm not sure whether people have directly looked at, um, uh, at a momentum, at, the, at what range of structures people have looked at for momentum dependent uh, top Higgs couplings, but it would be interesting to, to think more about it for sure. You would also expect some, uh, some, uh, some big modification to the uh, PT spectrum for TT bar Higgs at large, uh, at large Higgs PTs. Yeah, also, yeah. Uh, more questions? Yes, Claude? 
Yeah. Hi, Gavin. Hi, Todd. Um, so there's one item that you didn't mention too much, which is only one. Well, one which <laughs> comes to mind, and also when I read now your conclusion slide, is uh, PDFs. And um, also when we look at the history of the PDFs of the last 20 years, I mean, also their amplitudes played a big role, right? When you look at more programmers and all of these things. Um, so what is, is really now a question of what is your opinion? Would it be worth at this point pushing like what more folk the Mars on the 20 years ago to one order higher to really get the PDF evolution at the next order? And would that have an impact or is that, would that more like be an academic exercise that would be nice to have, but would not really have an impact on the IHC? Um, so I didn't talk about that much. I mentioned very briefly the higher splitting functions, but, uh, but I think that's an interesting question. Um, so there are two aspects here. There's the extent to which data will bring statistical improvements. And that's this plot here in the backup material, um, which assumes that theory stays unchanged uh, and looks to see what happens in the, uh, um, how our uncertainty of the PDF, PDF luminosities evolves or changes. Uh, and green here is the baseline. And when you add a simulated high, high luminosity LHC data, you get a reduction in this particular channel, this is the QQ bar uh, luminosity, uh, by a factor of two. Um, and we may find other ways of constraining PDFs. There may be further improvement here. Now, the other, the flip side of the question is the theoretical uncertainty. And people are only very, only just now starting to think about it. There's been some very nice work um, by the NMPDF group and uh, the, um, Harland Lang and Thorne have also been thinking about this. Um, now, for now, what they are saying is that the theory uncertainties are probably smaller than the uh, experimental uncertainties on this. Having said that, if we get this reduction of a factor of two, the theory uncertainties are likely to become critical. And the second question is whether uh, the theory uncertainties are really, whether we actually understand how to estimate them. And my suspicion is that we may discover that there's higher order corrections that are quite significant uh, at the next order. Um, because it's the first time that you really get sensitive to the leading log VFKL terms. Uh, so I think uh, having the, uh, the N cubed splitting functions, for the moment we have the NM, next, next to leading order splitting functions, having the N cubed order splitting functions is going to be a very important part of, of the progress. Um, I also worry that when we have them, we're going to run into a whole set of issues that were lurking under the carpet uh, at next to next to leading order, and that we're going to have to address them, in particular this BFKL issue. Okay, thank you. More questions? No? All right, if there are no more questions, let's uh, thank Gavin again. We can use the reaction button to applaud. And we are going to move on to the next speaker.